Hello, everybody. Um, so it turns out I catfished you. I said I would do a database case study, and I totally lied. There are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that, um, one, they take a while to research, and I'm about to go on vacation for a week, so I don't really have time to do all that research. Two is that a lot of the things I was seeing coming up when, you know, kind of looking into like how Cassandra, for example, works the way it does, we haven't actually covered yet. So I feel like I should probably cover those first. And as a result of that, um, I feel like uh, the video I'm actually going to make for right now is probably a better topic. Um, I'm making a couple others so you guys don't, uh, don't have to miss my beautiful face for too long. And I'll try and uh, do those as scheduled uploads throughout the week. Um, but if I don't end up posting anything else, then probably you can expect the next upload to be around uh, next Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. So with all this in mind, I'm going to talk about analytical databases because I kind of skipped over these, and um, it's pretty cool how they work, and hopefully it'll be a pretty quick video and easy to understand, so let's get into that. All right, so analytics databases, what's the point of them? Uh, the background is basically that uh, businesses often want to uh, run a bunch of internal queries on their data that they have um, in order to do things like A-B testing or other data science reasons to kind of see what's working, what's not working, and just get general aggregations over their data. The point is, though, since these queries take forever, since they're going over a ton of data, you don't want to be running them on your transactional database. The transactional database is the one that, you know, like the client might interact with or the client rights might go to. So instead, what you'll typically do is have a second database completely devoted to analytics where all of your internal analytics queries can be run on. And these work a little bit different than transactions databases, so we're going to go over those. Uh, typically, the process of taking the data from your transactional database and moving it to the analytics database is known as an ETL process, which is typically scheduled as a batch job, which means that once every time interval, we're going to be putting new data in there. And I'll go over what a batch job is in a future video. Okay, so the first thing to note is stars and snowflakes. So stars and snowflakes is basically the schema that we're going to use in an analytics database. It's not actually going to look like the same exact data that we have in our transactional database. So as you can see, um, looking at this image here, which I lazily copied from the textbook that I'm teaching from, we have this fact sales table. So what is that? This is a centralized table with potentially hundreds of columns. And it's going to have a ton of foreign keys to these dimension tables which in turn may even have more foreign keys to other subdimension tables. But the point is we have one centralized table that we can query over, and that central table has a bunch of events which have foreign keys that are relevant, or they don't, but either way it allows you to get all of the data centralized in one place. Um, so that is known as the star schema, and if there are a bunch of subdimension tables, it's known as a snowflake schema. Okay, so what's column-oriented storage? Because this is a term that you may have heard before, so I'm going to explain it. So transactions-based databases use row-oriented storage. They store the entire content of a row together on disk so that it can be accessed sequentially. That means it's going to be faster when we want the entire row. This makes sense because typically the row represents something like, say, a user profile where we want the whole thing at one time. However, in an analytics-based database, we're using a fact table where we have hundreds of columns and rarely we only need a couple of them at a time. So what's actually better to do is store all of the values of the columns together in one file. That's the idea behind column-oriented storage. Keep in mind that for each column, they need to be stored in the same order. Otherwise, we would say, oh, well, the kth value in this file is not the same row as the kth value in this file. So it needs to be consistent between them. OK, so let's talk about column compression. If each column has a ton of duplicate values, we can easily compress it. So I'm going to give you an example. Imagine the following column representing coding proficiency out of 10. Now, as you can see, I'm clearly not one of these values because I don't see any 10s in there. But the point is, we have three 8s, a 4, a 5, four 2s, and a 1. So what we can actually do is first start by using a bitwise encoding. A bitmap encoding is going to go and say this. For each value, put a 1 if uh, that's where the value is equal to it and a zero otherwise. So for example, for value eight, for you can, as you can see, the first three values in that column are equal to eight, hence there are ones there, and the rest are not, hence there are zeros. So we have these bitmap encodings, which are decently useful. However, we can actually further encode these into run length encodings. So how are we gonna do that? Well, I'm gonna say, okay, for value eight, look at that string of ones and zeros. 
To start, there are zero zeros, then there are three ones, then there are seven zeros. As you can see for value four, there are three zeros, then one one, then six zeros, and so on. So as you can see, we can take all of these 10 integer numbers and compress them into just three numbers, which is really great. Okay, continuing compression. Let's say now that we wanted to actually do like, um, you know, a query on some of those columns. Let's say we want to find all the rows where column A equals 10 and column B equals 20. Well, what we could actually do is take those two bitwise encodings for column A equals 10 and column B equals 20 and do a bitwise AND on them. So all the places in the result of that where um, there's a 1, we know that the column A is equal to 10 and the column B is equal to 20. Also, if we were just looking at uh, times where column A is equal to, say, 10 or 15, we could do a bitwise OR between the uh, bitmap encodings for A equals 10 and the bitmap encoding for A equals 15. Additionally, compression is really great because it allows more data to fit in the CPU cache. This means that we can go ahead and run a tight loop without any function calls on the, on the data itself, and that is a lot quicker because it can all fit in L1 cache, and in addition, this can be parallelized more. Okay, furthermore, if you want the columns sorted in a different way, say we want uh, you know, to sort by like a date key or something, um, we can actually do this by having a replica of our analytics database where we have those columns all sorted like that. Just keep in mind that every column in that replica needs to be sorted in the same way. And what this is really good for is A, it acts as an index if we want to do efficient querying. So say we're querying by some like seconds since epoch. Now we can easily find all the rows within a given month. But not only that, it allows for more column compression, especially on that date column, because it means that all of the, the dates that are the same are going to be right next to one another and they can easily be compressed. Okay, next, writing to column-oriented storage. So as I mentioned, we have a bunch of files on disk where all of the columns are in sorted order. So it'd be a real pain in the ass to have to take one value and just insert it in a sorted file. So what do we do instead? Well, we actually already have a data, data structure for this that we introduced a lot earlier, LSM trees. So all of the writes are actually going to an in-memory tree buffer. And then once that buffer grows too big, every once in a while, we're going to merge that LSM tree into those sorted column files. Additionally, this means that reads get a little bit more complex because they have to check both the tree and the column files and then merge those accordingly. Okay, next we're gonna move on to something called materialized views. Materialized views are essentially just a pre-computation or a caching of very popular queries that might happen on the analytics table. So let's say, I don't know, a sum of sales over the entire thing or maybe an average of you know, customers in a restaurant for every single day. Um, so the whole point is though, that since these are such common queries, uh, the database is gonna do them automatically so that you can use that result in subsequent queries um, as opposed to recomputing it every single time. So that's the pro here. However, the major con is that now writes are gonna take longer since materialized views need to be updated. And in addition, since these are pre-computed, there's a little less flexibility in using them than actually just doing a raw query. Uh, the one thing to note with writes taking longer is that this probably isn't a huge deal because writes are generally just done by batch jobs. And we don't really care how long it takes to get the data into the data warehouse as long as it's not like an obscene amount of time. You know, it's not like the clients are actually writing to the database, so having lower write throughput isn't hugely important. Okay, next we have a data cube. A data cube is really just a special type of materialized view that goes and aggregates all the results over a multi-dimensional table. Uh, this could either be two dimensions, three dimensions, or so on. And the example that I'll show here, I took straight out of DDIA, which means that um, we have the sales of every product ID or product SKU on every single day in the database. So you can see we have 32, 33, 34, 35, and onwards for product IDs and then the date key, and as we can see, all that's gonna have in the table is just the sales of that product on that day. And so we have a ton of pre-computations here, which can be really useful for a variety of other queries. Okay, in terms of actually summarizing what analytics databases are good for, it's really nice to have a separate database for expensive read queries, as opposed to using the transactional one that clients might use. Additionally, we can store our data even better in a column-oriented manner, which allows us to compress it and better utilize CPU's L1 cache. 
Finally, when writing to column-oriented storage, we can use an LSM tree as a memory buffer. Okay, another thing is just that, as a reminder, materialized views are potentially very useful for caching um, by pre-computing certain common queries. At the same time, they do make writes slower. Okay, I know this is a pretty quick video, but I'm just going to try and bust out a few quick ones. <clears throat> Done that before. Um, in order to uh, give you guys something to watch while I'm away. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys all have a great week, and this one's interesting.